We've been hearing repeatedly this afternoon and throughout the day about the interrelationship of rural health sustainability and access to rural economic sustainability. And this panel brings those issues together. So we have a, a diverse group as the other panels have had as well, including two experts on economic development. First, Reggie Taylor, who joins us from the USDA's Rural Development Division. And um, also Rob Gordon, who joins us from the University of Georgia's Archway Partnership. And I think Archway is one of, if not the newest, public service outreach unit on campus, um, working with local communities in a variety of um, capacities. And then we're also joined by, um, uh, by Andy Miller, the co-author of the article that we already heard referenced at um, over the lunch talk um, by Maggie, focusing on rural communities and how those interact, the, the problems of rural communities are interacting with rural health care. And then finally, um, Daniel Graves, who is a Georgia law graduate and a um, hospital board member, um, chair of a hospital board, who brings that perspective to us. And so what we hoped that this panel would allow conversation to develop around is how local government units and healthcare providers, local community leaders and healthcare providers can work together to address these interrelated issues of economic challenges for rural communities and healthcare challenges for rural communities. And we wanted to start by letting each of the panelists tell you a little bit about themselves and about their perspective on this issue, perhaps a relevant anecdote or project that they've worked on, and we'll um, work on some questions after that. So, Reggie, do you want to take it away? Can you hear me very well? Great. Thank you very much for allowing me to be on the panel today. And, um, I will just let you know that there is funding out there for the opioid uh, situation that's going on in rural communities. About $5 million from our uh, distance learning or our uh, community facilities grant dollars are available this time around. The funding announcement has come out earlier this year, excuse me, actually this week. And so uh, those of you that are interested in working with USDA to address some of these issues, please go to our website. Uh, that information is on there. And so you can see that and apply. Um, I do want to thank a couple of folks that I saw earlier in the room. There's Mark, Renfro, uh, Carrie from Elberton. Hi, how are you? Um, USDA, you know, we consider ourselves to be the um, the stability part of rural America. We do a lot of different things at USDA and people oftentimes just say, well, I thought you guys just inspected the meat and the food, you know? <laughs> and uh, when I tell them I can build them a school, they go, now how are you doing that? So uh, we do at Rural Development, the economic development part of USDA, building up the rural communities. And so that's my charge here in Georgia. I cover the whole state. Um, I've got some great working partners. Camilla Warren is in the room from EPA, and I really want to thank her for her time and the things that we do together with Brownfields and trying to cover the rural community. So I won't take up much more of the panel's time. All right, well, I, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, Andy Miller with Georgia Health News. We're a nonprofit uh, journalism organization just focusing on health care. Uh, it's free. There are no paywalls. Go right to it. You're not obligated to do anything but enjoy yourself by reading. Uh, I'm gonna talk, if, if I have just a couple minutes, about two places where I visited over the last year and a half. Um, let's start with Richland, which has lost a hospital. Uh, this is south of Columbus, lost a hospital back in 2013. And I went there about a year and a half ago and I talked to the mayor there and he told me that uh, it's nearly impossible to get a business to relocate there because they don't have a hospital anymore. And um, it's like 40 minutes or 40 miles to the nearest hospital if, if someone has a heart attack or trauma uh, in that community of Richland. He said they lost like uh, three restaurants closing and a grocery store in the time since then. So, uh, and when I first got into town, I was asking directions for the local hospital, and these two guys were, just told me, they didn't know who I was. They said, help us bring, help bring it the hospital back. And, uh, you know, it, it's a big gap in their community. The other community, Richland, which is kind of central Georgia, 
Uh, it's a ghost town. They lost their hospital in 2014. Uh, nothing's replaced it. They've, they've lost their bank, their local pharmacy. While we were there in August of this past year, the grocery store, the only grocery store in Wheeler County closed because they just didn't have any traffic. They lost 120 jobs when Lower Oconee Hospital closed. And, and so uh, to tie, and it was, I think, the biggest employer in Glenwood, that town, uh, the hospital was. So the, the tie between uh, a hospital's vitality and a community's vitality in terms of business is very strong. And unfortunately, in those two cases, uh, those counties are reeling business-wise because of what happened. So your turn. All right. Well, uh, my name is Daniel Graves. I'm from Elbert County, Elberton, Georgia. I'm the chairman of the Elbert and Elbert County Hospital Authority. We're a 52-bed facility providing emergency care, acute care, general surgical services, including uh, GYN and uh, orthopedics. Uh, we, were, uh, we were named the ninth best small hospital in 2017 by Georgia Trend Magazine, which made me think, who in the world is number 10? <laughs> <laughs> Sweet Lord, have mercy on them. <laughs> Y'all have been through a long day, I, and I, I want to, as a volunteer serving my hospital, I, I know that so many out here, you're, you're not here for business, you're here because of a passion that drives you, and it's that we're here to talk about economic development, and I will go there, but in all of this talk and everything we've done, there's an underlying thing that drives us all. The reason we're still sitting here at 2.45 in the afternoon is because because somebody's life will be saved by what we do. Somebody's family will be comforted by what we do here. And let me tell you, it means something. When I started with Elbert Memorial Hospital, I started with the foundation about 10 years ago. Nancy Seymour in the blue jacket, she said, oh, we'll raise a little money, we'll have a few shindigs, and it'll be great. I, I, did, not, I did not know that I was entering uh, and I've been quoted as saying this before, and I think the Georgia Health News, that I was getting involved in the preeminent social, spiritual, uh, moral question, the preeminent question facing our, our, our world, right, right in little old uh, Elberton, Georgia. And it's different, you know, as far as economic development goes, just to put some numbers in, in context, you know, in Elbert, in Elbert County, we're a, we're a county of 20,000 people. Our hospital is the fourth largest employer. Uh, what does that mean? That means we have 130 plus full-time employees and we have an additional 70 PRN and part-time employees for a total of 200 employees with an annual payroll of six, over $6 million. The last, uh, I believe it was the Fannin Institute that did the economic analysis and you know they, they estimated a, a 28 million dollar economic impact to our economy. Well you hear numbers like that thrown away, thrown around all the time and I, it goes, I, I don't know what that means but what I do know is that there are 200 people that live primarily in Elbert County that are bringing six million dollars of payroll. That's a, that comes out to, I can't do the math, I'm a banker and I'm terrible at math. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm even better at banking than I was at lawyering, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that, that, that's about, what that is, is that's, a, that's, a, that's an average salary well above the, the average salary of an Elbert County citizen. You know, I, I go to these meetings and when I, what I run into with economic development is that for 65 years in, in Elbert County, the hospital was just there. We did not have to fund it. We didn't have all, it was just there and it, and it, and it sort of ran itself. And now uh, you have this perception that, well, it's just gonna continue to be there. And, and, and now that, that the funding gets cut on every single level, that put, that's putting more and more pressure on that local economy and uh, to, to come up with, to fill that gap. And it, and it just, it's tough being the straw that's breaking the camel's back. Uh, 
We currently receive from our county $1.2 million a year in ad valorem millage. Y'all probably know this better than I do, but hospitals may or may not receive funding from the county and they may or may not receive it in a, uh, or from a local government. They may or may not receive it in a ver variety of ways. Uh, there is a millage provision in the Georgia Code that's set aside that allows you to collect a, uh, a certain amount of tax millage. You can actually get up to seven mills. If there is a county in the state of Georgia that has a political environment where you can get seven mills for your uh, hospital, I, I, I would love to come down there and meet somebody and buy them a cup of coffee and hear how they do that. Uh, but you, you know, some counties also add them as a line item to the county budget. Some counties include you in the splost. Some counties uh, 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 well, that, that, that's primarily what I have seen is the, the ad valorem, the, the line item, and then they can include you in the, in the SPLOS funding. Unfortunately, we do not. Typically, we have received about 400000 in ad valorem taxation, and then we got 120000 in SPLOS funding for about six hundred and twenty. This last year, we went through a revenue cycle crisis, as a, and that's, that's one of what I'm getting at is the disconnect. If you're not a hospital administrator and you hear the word revenue cycle, I mean, you, it just doesn't, it means a completely different thing in a hospital context. But we had a revenue cycle crisis and we had to come up with that. And that's how we got the additional millage. And it was a terrible, it's a terrible fight because it's the, it's the straw going on the, on the camel's back that's, that's totally changing the way uh, the, the local, what you're doing is you have a hospital administrator who is familiar with the nuances and intricacies of running a hospital. And then you have uh, a hospital authority board that uh, is trying to, to relay that information that they don't quite understand because we're lawyers and bankers and uh, farmers and, 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 and from broad spectrums and we're trying to understand it and then we're having to relay that information to an elected politician. The funding mechanism, the hospital can tell the county how much you need for indigent care, but that, is going, that decision on imposing that taxation to support that hospital is going to be made by a political entity. And uh, if, if y'all, uh, we're all from rural Georgia, or if we're not from rural Georgia, we're familiar with it, asking for additional millage in rural Georgia, well, that's, that's a whole new bag of fun if you haven't gone through it. I, I, hope, <laughs> I hope you get to do that. Uh, but what we did is, from an economic development standpoint, we put that in context. $1.2 million, how, many, how much do y'all think it costs to run a jail uh, in rural Georgia, in Elbert County, 20,000 people? It costs $1.6 million every year without fail, uh, and hoping nobody has a heart bypass that, uh, or a heart, you know, a heart transplant that goes into place. But the base budget for the Elbert County Jail is $1.6 million a year. <coughs> The road department is $1.6 million a year, and the sheriff's office itself, which is separate and distinct from the jail, is around the same, $1.6 million. So is EMS, although they make back about 80% of the cost. But what, what the challenge is for us as authority members is to relay that technical message from the hospital and put it in a political package that is palpable to explain, now look, you know, you're gonna spend $400,000 a year more taking care of the inmates, then you're going to spend keeping 200 jobs, six million in payroll, and saving people's lives. It's easy, right? You'd think that would just be a, a, a no-brainer. Well, I have learned uh, over the last year, in particular, just how uh, difficult that is. Rural hospitals, and I'm saying this, there's a lot of young faces in this crowd. I'm assuming there's some law students. Fifteen years ago, I was sleeping on the fourth floor of the Rusk Hall between classes. <laughs> Maybe during classes, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but to the young law students in this crowd, I want, I want to tell you, when you get out and you start practicing law, nobody's going to come to your office and say, you know what, my wife loves me, my business is doing great, I've committed no crimes, and i got a lot of money I want to give you. That, it, do, it does not happen. When people come to see you as a lawyer, their lives are typically falling apart. The skill set that you will have and develop in caring for those people and showing compassion for those people will uniquely suit you 
as a uh, member of a local hospital authority because the problems the hospital face are just about the same as a, as a marriage that's falling apart, as a life that's falling apart as a victim of an opioid crisis or a drug addiction of, of, any, of any kind. So I want to encourage you young lawyers, you stuck it out to, to be here today and, and hear this. But the reason you're here is because you have a unique skill set that uniquely qualifies you to be the leaders in this issue. And this is the preeminent social, spiritual, moral, and ethical dilemma facing uh, this country. So I, I want to encourage you to use that skill set uh, and, and, uh, and help me because Lord knows I need it. <laughs> um, it's hard to follow that. <laughs> Uh, I will say this, I, I went to law school so that I didn't have to do math either. Um, but, uh, and then of course came, became a public finance attorney um, where I've served uh, hospitals and hospital systems on financings for a number of years. Uh, but really the last three years I've had the pleasure to be the director of the Archway Partnership uh, here at the University of Georgia. And the Archway Partnership is pretty unique. It's a, certainly a public service unit or a public service arm. It's part of the public service mission. Uh, of the University of Georgia, but it's, it's pretty unique around the country. It's unique in the way that we serve uh, communities on their community and economic development needs. It was founded in 2005 uh, in Colquitt in Southwest Georgia, um, and really has since then expanded to the point where we serve eight communities at any one time. And what that really looks like is that we have um, a, a, we put a faculty member uh, in the community that we serve. We serve them on a long-term engagement basis over multiple years. And really importantly, we focus solely on what the communities want to achieve. So it's really focused on determining and helping facilitate conversations around what the goals and priorities for the communities that we serve uh, want to achieve. It's completely community-based. And as they identify those priorities and their goals, uh, around community and economic development, um, we will then find resources for them to address those goals. And those resources often are graduate students or other students at the University of Georgia. It's often faculty members, either through our other public service units or faculty in academic departments around the university or frankly other institutions of higher education. Um, or it may be some of our state partners, um, some of whom are in the room, that we sort of reach out to and say, hey, you have this resource, you have this program, um, you have this source of money, whatever it might be, and we kind of address it. Those community uh, you know, and economic development priorities are, are pretty broad ranging. Um, you know, everything from workforce development, K-12 education, uh, leadership development, economic development, you know, sort of more traditional economic development, but certainly healthcare um, related. Every one of our communities that we've worked with has identified health care and wellness and, and, and health, the provision of health care as a major priority for those communities. Uh, and again, just sort of trying to listen to them and say, hey, what is it that you want to work on and how can we connect the right resources to you? So it's looked a lot of different ways. Um, it's everything from, you know, developing wellness programs that might be community-wide. Um, it might be wellness programs that go into the school system or nutrition programs in the school system. It may be working with other higher education institutions to develop, um, you know, bridge programs, educational programs. We've worked in communities to develop um, LPN to RN bridge programs, uh, that sort of thing. Um, it may be a student, a master's of public health student, or, or another student at Georgia developing a healthcare resource directory for the community, just a way to kind of collect information on and really put it out to the citizens on everything that the community's doing. Um, to more specific, really uh, focused efforts uh, around more recently community health needs assessments, um, where we've partnered with the College of Public Health to, to conduct these in our communities, really focusing through a process of, of listen, citizen engagement and listening to the community to determine what it is they need from a health perspective and then um, put, giving that to the healthcare system, the, health, the hospital, the healthcare providers to then sort of put a plan in action. And in a lot of cases, they've implemented programs that have been you know, somewhat successful. Um, and then you know, we have uh, several researchers who are doing work around certainly the opioid uh, abuse crisis uh, and then a particular researcher who's been really focused on patient readmission issues, 
um, you know, issues trying to see how um, the, the, the care can be uh, enhanced after discharge from the hospital to try to keep them from being re readmitted um, and, and then suffer reduced, you know, reimbursement for that readmission. Um, all in all, our, our, our Archway par Partnership communities have worked on over 200 sort of healthcare and wellness related projects. Um, again, we're not necessarily the healthcare experts, um, although, I, I, you know, again, I've worked some in healthcare finance, but, but we're really more facilitating a community engagement process uh, that is designed to really identify the key issues that the community wants to, wants to address and then linking them to the right resource. Um, the important note that I'll tell you from, from my standpoint, the observation that I've made is that, um, you know, what I didn't tell you is that we, we really work day to day, our faculty members with a stakeholder group of community leaders. Uh, that stakeholder group varies but by community, but it's made up of um, representatives of the city and county governments, representatives of the hospital um, and hospital system, representative of other local higher education institutions like um, either the technical college system or other higher education institutions, uh, representative of business and industry, representative sometimes of neighborhood groups and other sort of uh, groups that um, represent pop parts of the population, um, represents uh, chambers of commerce, development authorities, all who are directly involved in economic development. Our, the success of Archway, and I think we've been reasonably successful so far, and, and we primarily serve rural communities, um, is that collaboration and trust that's developed among the leadership in that community. And I can't really stress how important that has been. Um, because when that group is sitting around the table, and especially for this crowd, when the hospital administrator or CEO of the hospital is sitting at that table or board chair is at, is at that table, they are seeing the they are understanding the concerns of the other partners around that table. So they're really gonna getting a bigger picture of what's going on from an economic and community development standpoint. And so they can, I think they've sort of understood how to appreciate other concerns that are going on, but not only that, but be able to talk about the concerns that are happening at their hospital. And so, you know, sometimes maybe it gets to the point where you are going to say, ask for a meal or an additional meal for, for funding, maybe that relationship has been developed, that trust has been developed, that makes that conversation a little bit easier. Um, but I think it, from our stand, standpoint, the, the development, the collaboration and development of the trust that occurs over time, it takes, a, it takes a while, it takes a long time, people have to be patient with it, but trying to put the community's interest uh, first and understanding that successful economic and community development really means collaboration. It really means sort of understanding the whole picture from what you're trying to do from the community standpoint. That's where we've seen uh, some success. Great, yeah. thanks. Um, so Rob's comments um, are a nice segue to my first question, which is I wanted each of you to talk about what you see as the, the major obstacles or barriers to implementing the host of various ideas that we've been talking about today, and certainly money is one of the biggest ones, and Daniel outlined that quite eloquently, and we've talked repeatedly today by death by a thousand cuts and leaving Medicaid dollars on the table, and um, so if we had more money, we could do more, certainly. Um, but Rob's comments point to another concern, uh, maybe a, a, a community or political or, or structural concern about how to facilitate trust and get communities working together. Um, Reggie and I have talked in another context about some challenges with the capital projects that USDA is willing to fund, but some regulatory barriers, certificate of need laws and other barriers to implementing those. Um, and Andy has been on the ground hearing stories repeatedly from citizens and may have good perspectives as well. So I wondered what other, what barriers you all have identified? Um, well, I mean, just for me, as a lay person, becoming involved in such a highly technical environment. Uh, I, I'm ignorant. Uh, that's the number one challenge. You know, I, Reggie, I did not know Reggie was, was in this world. Until about, <laughs> <coughs> no. Just had a birthday, come yeah, on. Birthday. <laughs> thank you. Thank God. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. Thank God you're in the world. Yeah, and there's my, there's <laughs> my son exactly. to prove thank it. Thank God. You know, I'm good. No, my, my point being is, there was a resource. I have been working with the hospital for 10 years. 
I have been serving on the authority since for five years. I've been chairman for almost three years. It feels like three weeks because it goes <laughs> by, it just is so fast. But I did not know Reggie and the USDA was even there. I, I mean, and how would I know because they're, they're, it was just not there. So I just wrote a note to myself, I, I wanted to make sure I said is, to the administrators in the room, don't assume that your board knows anything. You know, we need a, the, the, the GYN at the CAH needs a CT on the, you, you know, I mean, you, you, all this stuff. <laughs> don't, don't assume that we know, as lay people, anything, because we know nothing. We have, we have good people skills. We have the ability, we have good community connections. We have good relationships. But there is a huge, the three players in, that, in making a successful rural platform you know, are the professionals, the volunteers, and then the politicians. And there's a huge disconnect. And so what, the, the, the biggest thing that has helped us in Elbert County, uh, and I owe a lot of, there's a lot of credit to the Georgia General Assembly. There's a few, there are a few people in the state General Assembly that are championing our cause. Uh, one of them is Senator David Lucas. Uh, one of them is the Representative Tom McCall and uh, Representative Terry England the, I ha, I ha, and uh, uh, Senator Dean Burke. These are the gentlemen that I have met with, but what, the, way, the way the floodgates were opened for Elbert County was the Senate Rural uh, Committee came to Elberton. Uh, you know, we were, it was just by the, the grace of God that that came to our community. And, but before that, we had zero interaction, really. You know, we have a string of, if you're in rural health care, it's hard to keep a steady stream of CEOs and CFOs, and you have a, a huge turnover problem. And so by the, and nobody inherits a ship that's not sinking, so the priority is plugging the holes, and there's no time to be creative, no time to be proactive. And so, uh, you know, just to that question, I would just say uh, to the professionals in the room, the, you have a lot of network pre-built in your boards of directors for your hospital authorities, but we just don't know that you're, we don't even know that you exist. And so, uh, it, you know, any chance you get to reach out to your board or to introduce your board to someone like Mr. Taylor, and you know, I, I'm his biggest fan, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but that's, that's just uh, what I would like to say to the, to the, the professionals in the room. One, one thing that I want to mention that Daniel talked about is board members not knowing anything about health care and authority members not knowing anything. The Georgia legislature this year passed, uh, I think it's House Bill 769, and one of the features of that is that board members of hospitals, authority members, and, uh, and executives of the hospital must take a course, must be trained in, and it's going to be developed a coursework so that they understand some of the basic financials and the basic challenges of hospitals. So they're on the, so they understand what, what he's talking about. I, I have to say, and this is this is broken record department, right? I have probably talked, oh, I don't know, maybe to 30 uh, leaders of rural hospitals, and either on the record or off the record, none of them none of them uh, disagreed with the idea that Georgia needs to expand Medicaid. Now, they didn't talk loud about it because politically it was, it was a non-starter, or has been a non-starter. But I, didn't know, I don't know anybody who wouldn't say, yeah, it would help us. It would help our bottom line. And of course it would. I mean, the, the article that we did at Georgia Health News with Huffington Post, I mean, we, uh, we found that a higher number, a higher percentage of hospitals closed in states that did not expand Medicaid than those that did. Uh, so it's, uh, and, and another thing I, I will say is thinking, you know, getting business, the business community, the political community on board uh, in a rural community is vitally important. I mean, we went to Cook County and and, uh, and they, they thought out of, outside the box, and maybe that's part of the solution. I mean, they actually closed their emergency room. If you can think, think about that. Hospital without an emergency room. 
But they figured out that they were losing so much money there that they would have an urgent, they opened an urgent care and they just uh, are counting on nearby hospitals to take those trauma cases and heart attack cases. And the hospital has kind of turned around financially and now they're building a replacement hospital. So I, I think that that is something that uh, hospitals are gonna have to do too and, that are challenged. One of the things that, uh, well, a couple of things. One, I, I do agree with the collaboration. Um, when folks come to us, you know, they don't oftentimes have the buy-in from the, the business sector and, and the political folk, you know, your, your, your city council or your county government. You, you've got to have that teamwork. And, you know, I, as I look out in the audience, I, did, I see Nancy in the, in the foreground back there, and she's been a real advocate for the hospital over in Alberton. But I, I tell you, um, cash flow making sure that your financials are in order. We are a bank, okay, we do give out money. Yes, we do have loans, but we also have grants. But when you come to see us, you have got to have your, even if it's bad, that's fine. We understand that, things happen. But as long as it is correct, then we can work with you. Because we have to do our due diligence on the other end of it. You know, this is taxpayer money. So we want to be good stewards of that. So if you are seeing some issues and some pressures, and you know, we've talked to several different hospitals over the course of time, and you know, they've been able to figure, the, figure that out and then come back to us and maybe in phases do some redevelopment or change the way the hospital looks or how they go about going from you know, full care to down to an immediate care situation and then building back up, that's okay. You know, those things are fine. But I would say have your financial stuff in order, have the collaboration between the community and the hospital on par. And I, I think when we had a chance to go out, I was on that Senate committee that went out to Everton and, and sat down and just kind of listened. You know, that brought about a relationship with the hospital out there and, and, and the folks. And, you know, we had them into our office. And if many of you, if you don't know, our office is right down the street here. We're based here in Athens, the rural development section of USDA, we're right down the street. And so we're able to sit down with folks and bring them in and then kind of look at where their needs are. We'll bring in our staff, we'll say, just here's the programs. Tell us, you know, are you ready? You know, because we have to have you ready in order to help you. Uh, and, and, and I've done that with a couple of folks in the room and said, hey, I'll check back, check back with me. Let me know how you're progressing because we want to help you but you know, I have to be able to do it. You have to have yourself in order so that I can, I can get in and, and do some help and, and get you the financing that you need. Um, we also have our distance uh, telemedicine program. Um, a lot of folks have taken advantage of that. Uh, matter of fact, one of the panelists that was here previously at the Morehouse School of Medicine, we did fund them and there's some other uh, grantees out there that we funded in the audience out there. And we want to do that. You know, I was down in Reynolds, Georgia at one time. They were thinking about trying to reopen the clinic and all that. It, it just didn't work out. But one of the things that we did do is we have a relationship with Mercer now. And we want to continue that relationship with Mercer. Um, the school is fantastic. I think Dr. Sumner is doing a great job down there. And we want to continue to do that work. Um, but one of the things I think that is also important is just making sure you have touched base with your state legislator. You know, making sure your, 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 your folks can go down and advocate for you down at the house when those bills are flying back and forth. That is critical. Uh, you know, the, the, continue, the, the certificate issue, uh, working through some of that, 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 you know, we don't get at the federal level, we don't play in that field, you know, but we understand uh, what's going on in that situation. Um, but if that helps you all, the, the hospitals come to us and, and make a, you know, a financial, help us make a financial decision to help you, uh, we want to do that. So, you know, all those things tie together. So some, those are some of the barriers that we've seen and, and, you know, we're willing, we're here. We've always been here and we'll continue to be here to help rural communities. Rob, anything you want to add? I think, I mean, I think it's Archway, it's part of what y'all do is you're not the doers you're going into communities to help them do for themselves um, right yeah uh, well that's exactly the focus of archway is is really on the communities themselves so it's it's a process for trying to 
uh, facilitate that collaboration, facilitate those conversations among the leaders of the community. And it, and it takes the, that leadership you know, of the community to kind of move them in the right direction. But you know, in terms of sort of ways to build um, uh, collaboration, I, tell, I teach economic development in the Masters of Public Administration program, and I tell my students, I said, it's not, it's, you know, it, it seems so simple, but it's really hard to sort of put in practice, but it really has to do with everybody sitting in, in the room on a regular basis, getting together and understanding what everybody is doing, and so, and what everybody's sort of ideas and priorities are, and so I think that's um, absolutely critical for um, the healthcare providers to be in that room and be not only telling what they want to see happen, but also listening to what the rest of the concerns and the constraints are. Because certainly, you know, we we all know uh, money is limited to everybody that will be in that room, and so it's a matter of trying to decide what the community priorities are. Um, but you know, that that takes time. It takes that relationship. Um, overall, economic development to me is really about relationships. It's about sort of understanding um, you know, what, what everybody's trying to achieve and then trying to get everybody working in the right direction um, or in the same direction, I guess, whatever that might be for that community. Um, the one, one sort of specific thought I had was, one thing that's always been helpful, I think, it, at least in my experience, is trying to get people to, a, to the same playing field. So I think the point about education is a really good point, um, you know, trying to get everybody, you know, people come at it with a lot of different experiences, a lot of different knowledge, um, you know, whether you're a board member or somebody on a city council or a county commission, you know, you may or may not know the ins and outs of payor mixes and all those kind of things that relate to the hospital. So, so you kind of sort of, there is some bit of time that I think would be useful being spent just sort of on a basic education program for your key stakeholders in some way. Um, certainly the Archway Partnership has an already group kind of put together that we work with and it's easy for us to deliver that. In your own community, you might have to think about what groups you reach to try to do that. But I'll, I, I do think that that could be a, an important piece to starting um, collaboration. Yeah. Great. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, and this question is probably above all of our pay grades, but it, uh, there have been, um, there's been lots of literature on rural demographics and the grain of rural America and um, out migration, the rural to urban migration, especially of young, better educated individuals and the effect that has on local economies, obviously the effect that has on local health care as well in terms of the populations being served. And I don't know, do you all have the magic bullet for that? No. <laughs> No, um, you know, we're trying to, with, with our telemedicine and distance learning grant fund, you know, we're trying to, to, to refocus that a little bit. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had a um, listening session. How can we use telemedicine and our distance learning grant to help K through 12 and the technical colleges uh, address STEM? The STEM shortage or STEM training in the K through 12 in rural communities is it's, it's just not there. There's a lot of work to be done. And so we wanted to have a listening session. So we invited uh, the state school superintendent. He was there and a couple of other folks were there from uh, technical schools and uh, a couple of universities. And we wanted to have a conversation. You know, we have this grant program and it's distance learning and telemedicine, not just telemedicine. So how do we use the funds that we have to connect the, the folks at UGA to a, a, a school district down in, in you know, uh, Cordill or somewhere who needs a, a STEM class and the kids want to get trained and have education in that. You know, so we're trying to address that. And then if you can have those classes in those communities, maybe those kids will then stick around and you know, they'll go to college and or they maybe go to the technical school and get that training, but stick around in that community and help be a part of that change uh, and, and that growth that you know Rob was just talking about. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, for us at USDA, it, it's all it all has to be organic from the community, right? 
and we're looking for the communities to step up to us and say, you know, this is what we want. So when you come and work with the folks at Archway and, and, and they have that plan and you guys help develop that and bring that to us and say, hey, you know what, USDA, we know you have these type of fundings, we wanna do this. This is what we want you to help us fund. And, and those are the kind of things that you know, interests me, especially retaining workforce in some of our rural communities. That's got to be the first thing that, you know, uh, we're, we're losing the doctors, we're also losing the welders. You know, we're losing the plumbers. You know, we're losing those guys. And, you know, we, we push so hard for the Amazons to, to come in and, you know, do all those kind of things. But it's the welders, it's the, it's the plumbers. You know, it's the folks that want to do that work and stay in the community and, and have that quality of life, you know, that we want to assist. So, you know, that's where we are. And meanwhile, you've got the young families who don't have obstetrical services and don't have pediatric services. And Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I'm never one to shy away from these topics, but um, telemedicine, I think, uh, well, let, let me start off by saying rural areas, you all probably know this better than me, higher poverty, higher uninsured rates, um, higher levels of chronic disease, hypertension, diabetes. But there are significant things that can happen in a, to help even up the odds, I think. And one of them is telemedicine and school-based clinics. And I think Georgia, if not at the top of the, top of the line in terms of offering those services doing pretty well. We could do better. We could be reimbursing our providers better who do telemedicine. I don't think we're doing it as well as we could. Uh, I, and I think we need to get more primary care doctors out in these communities. And it's always been the case in my mind that the answer has been like school, re, school loan repayment programs, tax incentives, allowing nurse practitioners to work to the full extent of their license. Uh, these are things that can really help to kind of even up the odds in, in terms of getting help, the right kind of services in these communities. Sure. Well, I mean, it, my out migration is a, is, a, is a critical problem for Elbert County. I mean, we have, we have about, uh, I'm trying to think the exact number, maybe 10,000 emergency calls to our EMS service a year, give or take, carry close. You know, uh, we, we've been reviewing some of those records. We have 674 calls that never even came to, to our ER, not even, they just, they, they didn't do that. So, you know, it's hard, it's hard to serve in a small town because you could do 10,000 things right, and it goes without notice, and you do one thing wrong, and everybody at Ingalls, and everybody at Walmart, and everybody <laughs> knows. Uh, that, you know, it's a, it's a lot, you know, I went to school at a big school like Georgia, and I went to school at a smaller school, and, you know, uh, it, it, it's a lot easier to be, I was a lot easier to sleep on the fourth floor of Russ Call <laughs> than it was to go to sleep at the first school I went to. It's just hard. It's just harder, and so I, I, you know, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, I think it's, a, I think it's something that I would say to the professionals that are serving in rural communities. You have the board members like me that grew up in the town, and we know everybody. Uh, but, but but that relationship has got to be. You know, the, the the number one tool we have to stop out migration is. It, uh, you know, is, is, is the relationship, is having that voice, but we need your expertise. So, you know, uh, I know uh, Kerry, our CEO, has joined Rotary, and that's good, but even more than Rotary, you have to, I've, and I, forgive me to the doctors in the room, I've learned a lot about doctors. You have to pet them, and you, you, have, to t <laughs> you have to tell them they're, you have to tell them they're the, they're, you're the, you're, you are amazing, you are smart. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm being funny, but <laughs> but, it, but you can't just do it once. It's like it's like having a cat. I mean, or not a cat because you can feed a cat once a month, but you can't feed a. You know, you've got to do it weekly, daily. You you know, and, and that would uh, you know I would say that's a big issue for us is uh, trying to 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 develop that. 
But there is a, dis a part of that disconnect is as professionals, you're so focused on the reimbursement rates and the, the payer mix and things like that that you're, that you know, that, that, that there's a relationship. You can, you can go to Piedmont Athens Regional, God bless them, and you don't have to meet the CEO. Uh, but in Elbert County, you're going to meet the CEO. And, and you know, so, you, you know, as a rural professional, you've got to dig deeper and build that relationship if you want to stop the out migration. Um, why do we open it up for questions? Um, yeah. Can, I, can, I have a good example of this. Uh, Wills Memorial Hospital is just across the river. Uh, Tracy and uh, Mr. Larry are back there. Uh, uh, we, you know, that was part of that. We, did, we never even met until about you know, five months ago. And then, uh, and, you know, and it was just like, gosh, you're going through this too. You know, you're, you're, we're, we're having the same problems. Why in the world have we never talked before? Why in the world? So there are definitely opportunities because for us, we recently came out of a partnership with a large affiliated hospital across the river in South Carolina. And, and it was a square peg in a round hole kind of thing. We tried to make it work and it just, for a thousand different reasons, it didn't work. Uh, so we're looking for partners. I mean, that's no secret. I mean, I think every rural hospital is looking for some, you know, we're all looking for something. And what we found is that with some of the bigger systems, they have their own issues going on right now. I mean, all over the news right now. I, I get, at my bank, we have a night deposit box and I get notes. I had a note folded up 20 times and shoved in the night box and I opened it up and it says, you know, have you ever considered talking to the hospitals in Athens? You know, I'm like, oh, you know, no, no, really, you know, Athens is 40 minutes away, yeah, sure. But what I found is like, you, you know, they're, they're negotiating, with, they're, they're having the standoff of standoffs with Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know. And uh, other hospitals are the same way. And, they are, and the attitude that I have is very open-minded and very helpful, but it's also deep in the back of their minds. I get the feeling they know they're getting our good patients. Why would they be so concerned about getting the bad patients when they're already getting such a big cut? Which makes it even more important, we feel, at Elbert County, so maybe we can't reach out to some of the larger providers, but well, what can we do with Wills Memorial? What can we do to, uh, to can two smalls uh, I heard somebody, you would know the lingo, but that you take two struggling small hospitals and combine them and what do you have? You have one big struggling hospital. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but I will say, I will say that this consolidation among hospitals is only going to continue. Right. Uh, you know, and it is the big systems that are driving it. So maybe there is a possibility for smaller hospitals to consolidate in a way. But it's certainly something that's at the forefront of our, our minds. Yeah. What about um, hospitals self insurance or whatever? I mean, is it not, you know, I, I'm just ready to get the insurance out of the. And, you know, it seems to me now that as we're having this consolidation, that are we going to start seeing that they're going to offer their own policy? Anybody, is that a movement? Maybe not. Most large, medium to large companies now are turning to self-insurance, whether it's in healthcare or not, and they're seeing it as a savings. But of course, you have to have the the, the financials to make it work on on the front end. Uh, uh, but um, I, you know, I I've s many different arrangements. You can see hospitals have many different arrangements for their employees, but typically they buy into their own hospital's self-insured plan, I think. From an economic development standpoint, I will make a quick point though. When you're making the case with your partnerships and your collaboration, 
Elbert can't. We'll never be. I, the, the chairman is barely smart enough to do what he's doing now, much less running an insurance company. But we do have a granite industry that self insures its workers' comp uh, in Elberton. We have, and they could not do that uh, if we weren't there because we have an industrial medicine component to what we do, and our ER is specifically prepared to handle those industrial accidents, and we have them. Uh, but when we sell the economic, when we sell ourselves not just as a life-saving community necessity, we sell ourselves as an economic development piece. We we make sure that 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 is one of the talking points that our self-insurers are able to get to to do the rates and reserves that they have because they have that hospital. If we weren't in that, uh, then that has a dramatic impact on them thereby having a dramatic impact on their cost to operate our granite association. So it is a very uh, self-insurance, maybe not for the hospital, but for some of the industries that your hospital serves, now that is a very critical economic development point. It just seems to me like Piedmont could decide to self-insure, then they could go out and grab the little rural hospitals as additional, make their pool bigger. Well, they are doing that. I mean, they just taken over the hospital in Monroe, uh, Clearview. <laughs> Uh, I suspect they're still going to be looking for other hospitals to add to. They want to be statewide. They just added the big hospital in Columbus. Uh, and that, yeah, I think they're making no secret about the fact that they want to have, in order to talk to Blue Cross and say, look, we got however many hospitals, you got to deal with us. You got to pay us our rates. So. Yeah. I make a comment. I really appreciate the southern, um, being from the Corn Belt, the southern, the southern expertise in verbal delivery. I mean, I'll never, I've been here 35 years, and I'll never match it, but um, that's, that's not really a point. Well, I really wanted to um, recognize that, that really all these authority board members are serving as volunteers. This is charity, and it's not going on anybody's balance sheet. It's never reported. I It will, it's a great point, but it, it brings up two issues. Number one, I'm proud of, of Elberton's uh, foundation. We actually have a foundation with total assets of two and a half million dollars. For a hospital with six million dollars in assets, and that two and a half million not included, you know, that's a tremendous resource that's available. It's a two-edged sword because whenever you go to ask for tax money, they say, well, why don't you spend the foundation's money? And you, you try to explain to them that those are permanent endowments that are, you're supposed to live off the interest. They're restricted for capital improvements. It's not to make payroll. Uh, but when you have a politician that has a choice between raiding a private foundation or going and ask for an extra two and a half meals, well, guess which one is the easier target? Now, big major accomplishment in the General Assembly this year is the Georgia Rural Tax Care Credit. Oh my gosh, that's huge. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it went from 90% to 100%. You get 100% tax credit for your donation. And, and so, exactly, so for us, we, you know, as a poor community, 
the, the concept was you were going to, if you were, if you gave us a thousand dollars, you had a nine, if you had a thousand dollar state tax bill, or a nine hundred dollar state tax bill, you'd have to pay a thousand dollars to the hospital to get that nine hundred dollar credit. So you, you're basically rough math, and none of those nuances, but you're paying a hundred dollars more than you would if you'd have just paid your tax. Well, that's why we only use nine million of sixty million available. Uh, the school, the charter school or private school, you know, they, could, they had 100% credit. January 1st, 60 million, gone. And by raising that, we have already, we have already seen, we're, we're where we were through 12 months, through th four months uh, in, in Elberton already, and we don't know the first single donor. I mean, we, we you know, I mean, there is money coming from, from people who are just looking for the tax credit. And God bless them. I love them. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I think Crisp Regional, I, th I think it was Crisp, got a, like, when it was 90%, they got like $4 million or something to do equipment upgrade uh, at the 90% thing. So they were the, one of the ones that was, uh, I think it was Crisp. Maybe it was too many. But uh, there were only a couple that really got significant funding through the tax credit at the 90% level, but it, it's good to hear that the 100% yeah. is... Well, it's going to make a difference. I mean, you know, particularly for our people who pay quarterly taxes, you know, they can send the money in or they can make a donation. Well, you know, I'll, I'll make the donation. And so charity will have to play a bigger part. Uh, another bill that we pushed, that I pushed, and I, I just jumped off in the deep end with no idea what I was doing, was, uh, you know, we, we had House Bill 81, which was the tax intercept bill. You know, that was not a big hospital major, that was not a conspiracy. That was me in my office with Tom McCall that says, okay, well, we can't raise taxes. Tom McCall tells me we're not going to expand Medicaid. Uh, there's, the tax credit's not working. We need some money. We need some cash flow. So Mr. Taylor will actually return my call <laughs> when, I, when I actually, you know, bring it to him. Uh, and we, we said, well, if you have a public debt, and uh, if, you know, to the, to, if you're an authority hospital, which means you're a publicly owned hospital, you're above the poverty line, uh, 125%, and you have a bill of more, more than $25 that you're not making payments on, then we'll intercept your tax bill. I was not trying to push a radical agenda on the right or the left. I just thought, well, you know, if you're going to, if you're not going to, if the federal government's only going to give us this much money, and the state government's only going to give us this much money, and the local government's only going to give us this much millage, then what's left? The person and the, and the insurance companies are only going to give us so much reimbursement rate. Well, then you've got to pay your bill. And I found that's the, that's the most unpopular thing in the, in the, in the, <laughs> under the gold dome is saying pay your bill. And, and, and I get why, because we're all broke. Everybody's still broke. I mean, it's, it's the truth. But those are the kind of ethical and moral dilemmas that we're going to face as we choose not to expand Medicaid, but we're not going to increase your taxes and we're going to force the local government to, to, to fight a political fight with the farmers and the people down at the Breakfast Club to raise their taxes. So, so we're going to have a struggle between personal responsibility, but we're also going to have to depend more on charity. And I think that's a very, a very good point. I know Bill or Mason's going to have the last word this afternoon, and I know Rob's got a class to teach, and um, so, and everybody's got places to drive. Just, uh, just a very quick word. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Weeks. Uh, you know, we've thanked a lot of people here today, and, 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 and for good reason. If we tried to put a price tag on the, uh, t of the value of all of you in attendance here, all of the panelists, the University of Georgia, uh, it would be a very large six-figure number in terms of all of the resources that came and gathered here. But I would suggest to you that, as my friend uh, and colleague uh, Daniel suggested, the price of ignorance is a lot higher than that. In three years of doing this, I've seen so many relationships that were made at this gathering uh, and that went on to deliver value, both economic value, clinical value, it's just amazing uh, when you start breaking down the silos and having interdisciplinary academia, uh, 
uh, even the federal government represented, uh, media moguls like Andy from uh, Georgia Health News, um, and, um, and all I can say is how, how grateful I am, Elizabeth, to, to the law school and to the University of Georgia and to all of you on the panelists that gave of your time today and especially maybe those of you in the audience who came and with your great questions, your wonderful energy, GPT, where you, Rena, came and they, they do some of the world's great um, seminars around the state. As a Georgian, I am just so, so uh, uh, grateful for uh, all, all of what you've done. And if you go back and you, and you have gotten something from this, please tell your uh, colleagues, your peers, your friends what a good experience it was. We've gone to quite a, uh, quite a length to get all of this recorded. It'll be on websites and you can uh, flip that out uh, with an email. Go check out uh, some of this great information that was shared. And um, Mason, what am I forgetting? Other than just go home, go forth. As Daniel might say, go forth and conquer. Uh, thank you. Thank you all.